Uh, amen. Well, you may be seated. Praise God. Uh, it's so good to be together and to um, have these holy moments where we're dwelling in the presence of the Lord. So, hey, good morning um, and happy Mother's Day. Uh, let, me just, let me just pause for a moment and acknowledge that, that Mother's Day is a day where whatever emotions you're going through, the volume just gets turned up a little bit. So there is such joy and gratitude. And for some of you, there's, there's longing and there's heartache. And hey, wherever you are in your story, I just want you to know that you are seen and you are loved by God. And I just pray that you would, you would experience great blessing today as we go into God's word and we do something that I'm just so excited to do. So hey, if you have a Bible with you, why don't you open up and meet me in Ephesians. I'm just kidding. Meet me in the book of Ruth. Um, and we're going to spend about a month. Um, on a story that is an amazing story. I just, I just love, love what God is going to do uh, with us in the book of Ruth. If you're not that familiar with the Bible, uh, you can look in the table of contents. It's not like cheating or something. It's, um, it's about the eighth book in your Bible. It's about 20% of the way through. And it's kind of a small, obscure story. Actually, I've been a pastor for... Um, almost 25 years now, and I have never taught on the book of Ruth. Um, so I'm so excited. I've been getting my mind kind of blown as I've been going through this story, and it's been renewing my heart. And I've looked, and I'm like, man, is anybody like taught? I can't find anybody who's really taught much of Ruth. I'm actually, um, if you want to know the stream that I'm drinking from a little bit, one of my favorite pastors, his name is David Platt, and he taught this awesome series on this. And I am watching and learning and growing. So I'll be, I'll be you know, kind of quoting him as I go. And let me just, just kind of set up where we're going to be for the next month or so. Okay, you ready? Um, this is an amazing story. It's a beautiful story. Um, it is a heart-wrenching story. Okay, we're going to see joy. We're going to see grief. We're going to see high gratitude, gratitude. We are going to see like the depths of heartache in this story. By the way, there's a romance in the story. It's going to be a love story. Uh, for those of you who are married, I hope it kind of stirs up your love and affection a little bit. For those of you who are single, there's going to be awesome insights in this text about like what kind of man or woman should I be looking for for my future spouse? There's going to be like, like dating tips and married tips. And we're just going to, it's going to like the whole like spectrum is going to be in this book. I think we're going to love it. Okay. Um, not only uh, is this a story about a woman named Ruth, but we're going to see our story in this. Okay. You're going to see your story in this book. And when we look at the Old Testament, many of you don't realize that if, if you're not familiar with the Bible, but in the Old Testament, every story, every character, every symbol, every command, every promise, it points forward and whispers forward and symbolizes forward and it shouts out over and over and over, he's coming. There is somebody that, that the entire story points to, and we are going to see the gospel in the book of Ruth. We're going to see, like, our story lived out in this, and that's why um, it's going to be awesome. By the way, obviously God is the author of this story, but he used a human being who we don't know. We don't know who wrote the book, but whoever this person was, incredibly, like, Talented. I mean, people, and some of this does not come across uh, real well as you read it in English, but there is, in Hebrew, there's all these beautiful, like, literary things that happen. Like, there's, um, there's poetic alliteration, and there's these, like, staccato phrases that are just, like, meant to make a, a quick point. There's all these things that happen. So, um, in case you don't read Hebrew out there, uh, which I don't that well, um, we're going we're gonna to walk slowly through some of these things that will also be, you know, very mind-blowing, I hope. And um, here's why I wanted to start the book of Ruth today. Okay, ready? It's a story about a mom who becomes a single mom. It's a story about a grandmother 
It's a story about a mother-in-law. And you got to hear this. It is a story about an ordinary woman, very ordinary place. Like everything in the story seems very ordinary. But this woman encounters God. And she is going to experience the character of God and learn his mercy and his grace and his story in the midst of her very ordinary story. And she is going to be used in such a way that is way beyond what she could ever fathom as she gives her yes to the Lord. And I'm going to call us uh, to the same thing, okay? But, but um, to the moms and to the mother-in-laws and to the grandmothers in this room, uh, there is heartache and pain and why, God, what are you doing moments, which I would just ask for some affirmation from the ladies in the room. I would say part of the calling of being a mom, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is some pain and mystery and why God, what are, what are you doing moments? I don't understand you, Lord. Do you know the phrase in the New Testament? I love this verse. Um, some people can relate to this verse. Some people can't. For a while I couldn't. But Paul was talking about how he was doing and he said, I am sorrowful yet always rejoicing. And for a while, I was like how, can, like, how can you be both those? How can you be like sorrowful yet rejoicing, like together? Like, but I think the moms and the grandmoms and the mother-in-laws in the room would say, yes, yes, I can have sorrow yet joy mingled together. And we're going to see that in the book of Ruth. Um, and again, we're going to see God in our story. So if you have your Bibles, let's go. Uh, verses 1 through 2. We're going to go verse by verse like we always do. And today you are going to see hope in the heartache. Okay? Hope in the heartache. Uh, let's go. Verses 1 through 2. In the days when the judges ruled... There was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. First phrase, in the day when the judges ruled, all right? He's going to start out and say, hey, there's a timeline, there's a context for this story. It's in the days when the judges ruled. Okay, now you need to know that the time of the judges was considered probably the darkest days in the history of the people of God. In fact, if you have your Bible, if you have like an actual like pages Bible, that's what we used to read around here, like actual pages Bible, look back one page. Just like, like look back one page at the book of Judges and look at the final verse in the book of Judges, and this verse is like a summary of the entire book. Like this verse like captures the entire book of Judges. It's Judges 21, 25, okay? And so here's what it says. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Look at me. That's not good, all right? There's no king. We just live our own truth. We just do what we want to do. We, we just say, hey, this is right for me. It might, might not be right for you, but I'm going to do whatever's right in my own eyes. And that defined a whole epoch in history. Does that sound familiar? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And just to kind of summarize Book of Judges before we get to the Book of Ruth, there was a pattern that happened. Please don't miss this pattern. All throughout the Book of Judges, it happened seven times in the Book of Judges. Here was the pattern. Ready? The people turned their back on their God. The people said, I'm going to do things my own way. Thank you very much. I'd like to not repent, follow you, depend on you in faith. I'm going to do what I see is right. And God's like, all right, I'll let you do it then. And what happened is pagan nations would invade, oppress, enslave them. And when they were enslaved and had nothing, finally the people would turn. Here's a pattern. And they would cry out to God and say, God, we repent. We want you again. Can you send us a deliverer? And God, here's a pattern, he sent a rescuer, a deliverer in the form of a judge. So there's one named Gideon. 
Gideon, and one named Samson, and one named Othniel, and one named Jephthah. And it was like book of Judges over and over and over. And they would rescue the people. And then here's what would happen. In their freedom, the people of God would get fat, happy, apathetic, content, and say, well, I think we're going to do it our own way and whatever we see is right. And they would again turn their back on God, drift from God, and be oppressed. Does that sound like a familiar pattern? Everybody did what was right in their own eyes, okay? In the midst of that book of Judges, this story of Ruth happens in the midst of that pattern. And so let's look back again, one and two. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Okay, now listen. We don't realize the intensity of that word. Here in America, when we say, God, we're starving. What should we, we're, we're trying to figure out what to get for the next meal. We're trying, to, we're trying to make choices. Can you imagine, for example, being a mom and, and having no idea where food could possibly be happening to, to feed your children for the foreseeable future? A famine was like a, a heart-wrenching, like deep pain. There, there are places in the world in famine today. Um, in Yemen, there's famine. In places in Africa, there's famine. There's, there's famine. But, but you need to understand that back then, and certainly in this, in this moment, famine was one of the symbols of like the oppressive like judgment. Like, like here were people that turned their back on God. And the author even wants to bring out a point. Watch this. It's a literary point. There was a famine in the land and a man of Bethlehem in Judah. The word Bethlehem in Hebrew means house of bread. And here's the literary point. There was no bread in the house of bread. All right? And in the midst of that moment, please don't miss this, a man and his family made a terrible decision. All right? They are in Bethlehem. They're in the house of bread. They're in the place where they can do like what happened all throughout Judges and what God called them to do all throughout the Bible, to say, God, in the midst of this difficult moment, in the midst of this mysterious moment, we're going to turn to you. We're going to repent of our sin. We're going to trust you. We're going to depend on you and watch you, who, oh God, to provide and protect and be our God. But that's not what they did, all right? It says in verse number one, that this guy left, brought his family with him to sojourn in the country of Moab, okay? And Moab, if you were an Israelite reading this, there would be a collective gasp, okay? Okay, because Moab was a word, was a place that basically meant far from God, okay? Moab, first of all, geographically, it was far from God. They were in the promised land. If you know the story of the Old Testament, like the people were longing to get to the place where God was like, I'll be with you, I'll provide for you, this is my promised land. They left house of bread, promised land, and went to Moab. So that's just geographically, but way more than that. Spiritually, Moab was an evil, wretched, far from God place, Okay. And, and I'll just spare you some of the details, I guess, because, I don't know, Sunday morning or whatever, but um, horrible sexual immorality, horrible idolatry. They had child sacrifices to their demonic, horrible God, Kamash. It was like this so awful of a place that God said in Deuteronomy 23, God said, you are never to go to Moab. You are never to intermarry with anyone in Moab. You are never, it even says in Deuteronomy 23, no one, no Moabite is allowed to enter the assembly of God up to the 10th generation. This was like this evil, horrible place. And so you've got this guy who's like, hey, there's no bread. We're not trusting God. We're not going to like do it. His We're going to run as far as we can from God. We're going to Moab. Chapter 1, verse 2. Watch this. The author starts giving us names. And in 
this book of Ruth, names are going to be very significant. A name isn't just like something that you're called, okay? Like, like, like we, we saw joy and grace um, and Reeve dedicated. I, like we saw joy and joy. Like there's a name calls out an attribute. Names are important in the Bible, okay? And we're going to see something happen very important with these names. So we get the names in verse 2. The name of the man was Elimelech. Okay, I know this is technical, but Elimelech is a phrase. El means God. Melech is the Hebrew word for king. Elimelech is a phrase that means my God is my king. Don't miss the irony, okay? The author's like, don't miss this, all right? Elimelech, who is from Bethlehem in Judah. Do those words mean anything to any of you here? The one whose very name is my God is my king in a time when there was no king, everyone did with himself, left the place of Judah where one day there would be a future king that would change the story. Left Bethlehem, the house of bread, and is like, I'm leaving Judah. My God is my king. I'm not acting like my God is my king. I'm going to Moab. And he brought his wife. Look at verse two. The name of his wife was Naomi, which means the pleasant one. I'm leaving the land and taking my wife, like whose name is the pleasant one in the pleasant land. We're doing our own thing, okay? And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, which sound like these bold warrior names until you know that they meant sickly and wasting away. So you got Elimelech, don't name your kid Kilian. You got Naomi. You got Malon and Kilian. And this guy makes a terrible decision, turns his back on God and says, we're going to try it our own way. And let me just pause. Um, let me just ask you, have you ever known ultimately? Have you, have you ever followed that pattern, by the way? I have. It's like I know what the Lord wants. I know his like passion for my life, but right now I'm kind of like, I'm not going to depend on him. I'm going to kind of drift and do it my own way. My question for you is, has it ever gone well for you when you've done that? Like ultimately, I know maybe short term, but ultimately, has it ever gone well for you or anyone that you ever know of when you turn your back on God and go towards Moab and live away from God? Let me tell you something. This man made this decision and we're going to see 10 years of heartache represented in the next three verses, okay? So let me read verses three through five. In Hebrew, this is like, it, it's, it's a technique. It's a staccato technique, which means no emotion tied to it, like no, like, no like extra story, just like cold, hard facts, 10 years of heartache in three verses. You don't put these on your refrigerator. These are horrible, ready? Verse three through five, watch what it says. And it's just heartache. You got to feel the heartache of these. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years. And both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Okay. So just let's pause. And even from a mom's perspective, I want you to just like hear this. Like you got to hear the heartache of this woman that just happened. Okay. Hear all the heartache of the story so far. Ready? Here's a woman. And, and first of all, she sees her family starving. She goes through those emotions. Um, she sees her husband say, I, I don't care about God. We're uprooting from the pleasant place. We're not, not going to live like my God is my king. We are going to Moab, okay? She leaves home. All she knows, she gets to Moab. Her husband dies, okay? Not only does her husband die, then her two boys go against the law of the Lord and they marry Moabite wives, which would have been another collective gasp, like this intermingling with, with everything away from God, this false, horrible God of the land. Husband dies, boys like leave home, marry Moabite wives, and then Malon dies, and then Kilion dies. In 10 years there, they obviously didn't have any kids. 
They didn't have any, any sons. So suddenly this, this woman is without husband, sons, grandsons. She's alone. And, and the two like most painful aspects of the ancient world all of a sudden are in your face in this story. And I want to describe both of them, okay? Biblically, in the ancient world, here's the two greatest heartaches. Number one, The ultimate curse and tragedy in the ancient Near East was the extinction of one's name, okay? Meaning no heir to carry on your name. It's as if your family legacy and name was erased, and it was just this horrific feeling, okay? So number one, no heir to carry on their name. Number two, most feared thing in the ancient world, was to become a widow, okay? And here's what it meant, ancient world, to be a widow. Not only no husband, sons, grandsons, like, like the sons and the husband, they provided for and protected a woman. But you need to know two things if you're taking notes. This will be so important for the story, so I'd love for you to write these both down. Number one, there was no tangible provision. And number two, there was no intimate connection. No provision, no connection. No provision meaning no food, no like provision, no one to provide. No connection meaning relationships like, like alone. You have this woman and the greatest like pain was no provision, protection, connection like she has just loud and clear shouting out from this text, no hope, okay? No hope. That's what Naomi is going through right now. There is no hope. And you got to feel the pain of that verse to hear the beauty of the next verse, okay? Verse 6 through 7, watch this. This is the first time that the Lord is mentioned in the book of Ruth. Watch this, verse 6 through 7. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. We're introduced to the Lord, okay? And this is the name Yahweh. Remember, names are important. This is the name Yahweh. This is the name that God said, this is the name I want to be known as. This is the name that Moses heard at the burning bush. This is the name that means the intimate, connected name of God, that I love you, I want to be near you, I want to provide for you, I want to protect you. This is the name I am who I am, okay? Yahweh had visited his people. Whole story is about to tilt because a woman in a foreign land who's a widow, no provision, no connection, here's the Lord has visited his people. And she makes a decision that's the opposite of the Elimelech decision. She's like, we're going back. We're going to the Lord. The Lord is near. We're going back to the heart of God, in the presence of God, in the place of God. We are going back. It's like the light bulb goes on. And and I just want to ask you the question. Do you think, and I'm not going to tell you now, Do you think that the Yahweh God, the God who is near, the God who loves his people, is able in the midst of ultimate heartache, in the midst of like no hope, in the midst of here's a woman with no tangible provision or intimate connection that God might, here's an important word, ready? Redeem her story. You think God has a higher plan in the midst of the greatest heartache? You think think the living God might just flip the script of this narrative? You hold on to that question. Naomi says, I'm going back, all right? I'm going back, all right? In verse 8 through 10, here we have the first words spoken in the book of Ruth. Watch this. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each of you in the house of her husband. And then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices, and they wept. And they said to her, no, we will return with you to your 
people. This was more than just like a goodbye moment, okay? This was Naomi saying, hey, you've served me. You've been with me. I want to bless you. Like, there is nothing for you back in a foreign land. You're Moabite women. They'd be a gasp when you enter. There, there's, you don't have a husband. Like, you don't have, my, my sons are dead. We don't have any grandson. Like, like, there's nothing. Go back. Restart your life. Go, go, go back to what you know. Go back to what you're comfortable with. Like, go back to your life. And these, these two women say, no, no, we're going with you. Like, we're staying with you, Okay. Verse 11 through 13, for the second time, now Naomi is going to like make an argument. And this argument is pretty strong, okay? She's going to up the ante a little bit and watch her argument. Look at 11 through 13, watch this. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way. For I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me to me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She makes an argument that uh, is pretty strong. Here's what she says. Your name will be extinct. Like, that's horrible. All three of us are widows. You'd still be a widow. That's that's horrible. I've got nothing for you. There's no hope. And then she points to something that needs a little bit of explaining. Okay? To be a widow in the ancient world in Bible times was so devastating that part of God's law, here's what God said, okay? God made a law in Deuteronomy that If you were a widow, one of the brothers of your dead husband had to marry you so that your name wouldn't become extinct, so that you could have another child, so that your name couldn't be extinct, and so that this husband, your brother-in-law who married you, could provide for you and protect you. And time out, some of you are saying, are you telling me I would have to marry one of the crazy brothers of my husband? I would rather be a widow. Thank you very much. Um, not in that day you wouldn't, okay? Because there was such horror in this, okay? So, so hear this. Naomi is like upping the argument, and she looks the two daughters in the eyes. And verse 14 is unbelievably important. In the world of pointing forward and following Christ and in the world of this story. So underline it and don't miss verse 14. Let me read it to us. Unbelievably important. Here we go. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Don't miss this. Orpah counted the cost, weighed out the mystery, realized, I I don't know the future. I don't know where we're going. I don't know if it's going to align with my goals, my dreams, my heart's desires. She counted the cost and she said, it's going to be tough. And when the going got tough, she bailed. And she said, no, thank you. Okay, I'm going back to my comfort. I'm going back to what I know. I'm going back to my old life. I wanted to say, yes, I'm with you. But when things got difficult, I'm turning my back and I'm retreating back to my comfort zone. Ruth clung. I want you to underline that word, clung. That word to cling, that Hebrew word clung, is the same word um, used throughout the Hebrew Bible for actually the depth of covenant of a marriage relationship. It's this oneness kind of word. Ruth, hear this. She counted the cost. Ruth realized what it would take to follow her. Ruth also realized, hey, there is unknown, there's heartache in the story but I am going to choose to cling to you. I'm going to choose oneness with you. I'm going to choose to live even in the midst of the 
known, and it's just an awesome picture of what it means to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Man, he doesn't promise you a comfortable life. He doesn't promise you a life without mystery and heartache. He doesn't promise, he just says, will you follow me and trust me in the midst of the unknown? And the call to follow Christ, please don't miss this, is a call to cling. It's a call to cling to the Lord, to trust the Lord and to cling to the Lord. Can I look at every single one of you in the eyes? Please don't miss this, okay? This isn't going to make sense to the rest of the community because they don't know the book of Ruth, but this is going to make sense to you, okay? We're going to say this several times the next several weeks. Ready? Don't be an orpa. Don't you be the type of follower of God that says, I'm in, I want to follow Unless, unless it doesn't align with my hopes, dreams, and desires. Unless there's, there's mystery and heartache in the path. Because if there's mystery and heartache or even offense or anything like that, in that moment, I'm going to make the decision and I'm going to turn away from that wild, adventurous, heartache-filled, joy-filled, follow you to the ends of the earth, and I'm going to do my own way, my own thing. I'm going to retreat until I like it again. Then maybe I'll follow. Don't be an orpa. Western Christianity is filled with orpas. Let me say that a second time. Don't be an orpa. Don't be the kind of person that says, when the going gets tough, I'm out. As long as I like it, I'm in. When the going gets mysterious, I'm retreating from the Lord. Let me say it a third time. Don't be an orpa. Don't be an orpa. Means you got to choose to cling. And Naomi looked at Ruth and she's like, I, I, I see your heart. For a third time, verse 15, she's like, I'm going to try to talk to you one more time, Okay. One more time. Here's my last argument. She said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. And then Ruth is going to give the most famous phrases in this book and some of my favorite phrases in the Bible. Um, For some of you, one day when I officiate your wedding, this is the verse we're going to quote, okay? Watch this, okay? You might want to underline and memorize these verses, verse 16 and 17. This is so gospel rich and called with the call to follow Christ. Watch this. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. Ruth said, I'm in. I will cling. I'm in. I'm going to follow you. Like, like I'm following you. And, and most scholars look and say, this was her conversion moment. She's like, she's like, your God will be my God. The God who has visited your people, I'm in. I'm leaving the land of Moab, count me in to follow your God. Okay? Remember that for the rest of the story. Okay? And it kind of begs the question, like, does the God that we know, does the God of the story, do we think that he can take the absolute most, like, ridiculously illogical situation, a pagan Moabite widowed girl, like, like from nowhere, can he provide for her with tangible provision and intimate connection? Does he have a story for a girl who says, I don't know the future, but I'm in. I don't know, but I'm clinging. God, you will be my God. I'm choosing to follow you. Does the God that we follow respond to a heart attitude like that? That's the question. We're going to see something in the book of Ruth that will blow our minds, okay? But before we get there, today we're going to close with verses 19 through 22. And in 19 through 22, we're going to see ultimate heartache collide with the future of hope, okay? Ultimate heartache and ultimate hope collide. So first we're going to see Naomi's deepest pain. Look with me at verse 19 through 21. Watch this. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. 
And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Here's what she said, basically. I was once full, and now I'm empty. I'm relationally empty. I'm emotionally empty. I'm spiritually empty. Like, I'm empty. I'm empty to the point, and I think in her lowest moment where she was like, I'm ready to change my identity. Like, like don't, don't, don't even call me Naomi. How can that be my name? Call me Mara. Okay? And, um, I mean, so far in the story, I don't know, maybe it's been hard to be like, hey, isn't Naomi awesome? Don't you have a great attitude? Like, but, but can our hearts go, like, just pause and go out to Naomi for a moment? Like, here is a woman who very, like, validly has felt emptied of everything. And I just want to look you in the eyes and ask you this. I, I, I don't think, I hope, that you haven't been through a story that's as painful as chapter one here. But honestly, and I love how the Bible is so honest. I love how it doesn't hold anything back. Do you know what it feels like to feel emptied? Like, do you know that? Do you know what it feels like to feel like that rejection of I, I once was full and I feel empty? Or maybe, do you know what it's like for a spouse or another family member? Like, it once was full. Now I just feel so relationally emptied. Do you know what it's like to be like, my friends, like, have turned their back on me and let me down or... The church has let me down. Or, can we be honest? God has let me down. Or all I've dreamed of and longed for is meaningful work or a meaningful, or a child. I just want to have a child. It's Mother's Day. I'm dying inside. Or all I want is, is to be married. When is that going to happen in my story? Like, do you know what it's like to feel like empty? Like, God, I want to try, but I feel so empty. Okay? Almost like, 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 I don't like, Change my identity. Change, like, don't call me something. Like, change, like, she was in her lowest point, but in the midst of that, I want to show you just the hope that starts to spring up in this. Okay, ready? Here we go. First of all, verse 21, she's like, why call me Naomi? It's not my identity. I'm changing my identity. Call me Mara. That's my perspective of myself. Verse 22, can we flip to verse 22? Next phrase, please don't miss this, huge implications. Next phrase, so Naomi returned. Let me make a point, okay? Verse 21, she said, I'm changing my identity, now call me Mara. Verse 22, God called her Naomi. Even in her lowest moment where she wanted to like say, I'm changing, the perspective of God on who his daughter was did not change. All right. Is the God that we serve able to take even the most heartache-filled moment and say, I'm flipping the story and I'm going to bring out a story of my pleasant one even though she's in heartache? Yes, he will. Wait till you see what happens. Okay. And not only that, not only that. Remember how I said names were so important? In verse 19 through 21, Naomi is going to call out the name of God. In fact, she's going to choose two names for God. She's going to say each one two times. We have four, can I have verse 19 through 21? We have four times the name of God called out. And scholars look at this and, and, and say, even in the midst of her darkest moment, she chose such a significant name of God, like there was a little seed of hope that was, that was growing up in her, and certainly it was foreshadowing the rest of the story. Here's what she said. She said, the Almighty, twice. And she said, the Lord, twice. The Almighty, if you're taking notes, please write this down. The Almighty is the Hebrew word El Shaddai, okay? El Shaddai, here's what that name means. Here's the character or attributes that El Shaddai points 
to, okay? El Shaddai means the Almighty God who provides and protects, but very, like, like it's this very tender, intimate image. Can I tell you what it is? El Shaddai, Shad is the Hebrew word actually for a nursing mother. It's actually the word for a woman's breasts who is nursing her child. And the picture there is here is a baby that is dependent on his or her mother to provide and to sustain life. That's what it means. Even in the midst of her like darkest, like I am so hurting, I, like, I don't even know who I am anymore. She called out, and yet there's a God whose very name, whose very name means he is able to provide and to sustain for me. Okay. Second word, Yahweh, the Lord. She says the Lord twice. Again, what's the name of the Lord? What's the name of Yahweh? The God who is intimately connected to his people. The God who's connected, the God who's near, the God who loves. Remember I said the great tragedy of this story? Here is a woman, here are two women that do not have tangible provision and intimate connection. And in this last paragraph of chapter one, she's like, God, let me call out your name. You are the God of tangible provision. You're the God of intimate connection. Do you see that? Oh God, it's as if to say, even if all I've got left is to call out your name, would you provide for me? Would you provide connection for me? And it's a foreshadowing of what's coming. And I'm not going to tell you what happens in the next few chapters. You're going to have to come back. But my question for you is how do you think our God responds? The God whose name is El Shaddai and the God whose name is Yahweh when he sees his children say, I'm in a dark moment and yet I want to call out and depend on you and lean into you and run back to you and say, you are the God who provides and sustains. You are the God who provides my deepest connection. How do you think God is going to respond? You think God can flip the script for Ruth and Naomi? And I want to bring you back to verse 22, and then I'm going to make just a couple of applications. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Last phrase of verse 1. Watch this. We'll get into this next week. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. You hold on to that, okay? God's about to change the story. So let me give you just a few little application points. Number one, God has a way of bringing hope in the heartache. Look at me. Are you in heartache? God has a way of using heartache as the backdrop, as the context to showcase his hope. Okay? How do I know that, David? Like, well, like, do you see that anywhere in the Bible? You can flip the page and put your finger down. Story of Joseph, story of Gideon, story of Mary, story of, uh, story of Jesus on the cross, for goodness sakes. You pick a story, you're going to see a heartache, and you're going to say a God who says, watch what I can do in the darkest moments. Second point, this is going to be so encouraging for you guys. This is for me. Ready? Your past sin does not disqualify you from the mercy of God. Can I say that again? Have you walked in Moab? Have you ran from God? Have you turned your back on God? The record of your sins, it says in Colossians 1, when you choose to follow Jesus and cling to Jesus, it's nailed to the cross. He remembers it no more. Your sin is not as strong as the mercy of God. Though your sin is great, his grace is greater. All right? Your past sin does not disqualify you. For some of you, that's the message you, you need to hear. And then finally, when God's people trust him to be the source of provision and connection, God will show redeeming love. He's a God who redeems. What does that word mean? We're going to get into that next week. He's a God who redeems. When God's people trust him, to provide, to be the source of intimate connection. 
He can redeem your story. He can redeem your story. And how do I know that? How do you know that, David? Remember I said that everything in this book of Ruth points forward to the great big story. Can I tell you the great big story? Right? Great big story of the gospel. How does this affect all of our lives? We all have sinned, turned our back on God, and went to Moab. Every person in this room. There's not one of us who've lived a righteous life. But God said, I'm not staying away. I'm going in. I'm sending my son. And Jesus lived the life that we could never live. And then died on a cross. And when he died on the cross and rose from the grave, you want to know what God said? God said, remember, my name is El Shaddai, the God of provision. Jesus is the provision. He's the provision for our sins. And anyone that believes in him and receives him and trusts him and says, I'll cling to him, he's the path to intimate connection with God. All right? Jesus is the one who has rescued us. All right? That's my story. That's your story. And that's the story that we're going to see in the book of Ruth. Worship team, would you come on up? Um, Oh, Father, would you, um, would you open our eyes and our hearts to the story, the great story? Thank you that you're a God that is not done with us. Thank you that you're a God that brings hope in the midst of the greatest heartache. Thank you that you love us and meet us and want to be close to us. Jesus, we just love you. And as we take communion, we want to just celebrate you, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I heard that quote this last week that said, in the darkest times, when we feel like we've been buried, from God's perspective, we've been planted. Isn't that beautiful? Like when you think you're buried... From God's perspective, he might be planting you to bloom something that will showcase him. Um, and the ultimate story of that, we just symbolize now with communion. The night before Jesus was crucified, he's like, I'm about to go through the greatest heartache. My body's going to be broken. My blood will be shed. And in this heartache, this is my plan to surge forth the hope that will change the world. And so we take communion uh, to celebrate, to remember, uh, to humble ourselves. Actually, it's this moment where you're meant to, to look inward and to say, God, I, I repent. Like, I don't, like, am I living like a limelech? Like, there is no king? Am I running in Moab in any way? God, forgive me. Let me cling to your body and your blood. I want to follow you, Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, um, it's a moment to like repent and to come back, come back to Bethlehem. If you've never given your life to Jesus, um, oh, this is the moment. Like, don't, don't come up and take communion as a ritual. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Say, I want to cling to you. I've been walking in Moab too long. I want to cling to you, Jesus. And watch what he can do with your story. So if you're on one of our ministry teams, would you come on up to the front or to the back? And... Um, we would love to pray for you. Anyone will pray for you here. Um, take some time before the Lord. Um, humble yourself. And when the moment's right, come on up and take communion. And then let's celebrate in worship. Okay? Spend some time before the Lord, then come get communion.